Okay, so in our last note, I introduced um, a little bit about the, the structure of DNA and its composition and, and the different um, components that make up DNA, but we didn't spend a lot of time on how that actually all looks when it comes together. So I want to spend a little bit of time on that um, because where we're headed with it is, if you recall from my last note, we I um, reviewed the idea of mitosis and the process of mitosis and how it makes new cells for our body, which is really an important part of this whole unit. Um, in order to make new cells for our body, we need to be able to make copies of our DNA for those new cells. And so that's where the um, next section of the unit's headed, and it's titled DNA replication, which means to make a copy of yourself. And so in order to understand how it can make a copy, we should just kind of look a little bit more at the structure of the DNA. So I've got, um, what I wanted you to do is, so what you're going to see on the screen is um, the same notes that I asked you to print off, and why I asked you to print them off is because they're important, and I'm going to have you fill in some things as we go through this note. So these are just to become part of your notes, so when you're studying and preparing for your test, I'm going to highlight the important parts of this. So first off, just as a recap, this will be familiar from what we looked at yesterday, um, we have the three parts that make up our DNA structure. So we have a nitrogenous base, and in this case it happens to be adenine. Oops, nitrogen base, okay. Okay, and then the second component we have is what we call a deoxyribose sugar. And then the third component of DNA is a phosphate group. And if you recall, the phosphate and the sugar make up the sides of the ladder. And the nitrogen bases make up the steps of the ladder. Okay, so DNA um, nucleotide, we talked about too. The, the term nucleotide means that we have one phosphate, one deoxyribose, and one nitrogen base. So this entire unit here is considered a nucleotide. Okay, so moving on, if we break down the four n possible nitrogenous bases that we have, I introduced these to you in the last note, but I just want to, um, maybe we can highlight some things about them. So if I group these two single ring structures, these are our pyrimidines and the two that have the double ring structure are our purines. Now this is important to know how they come together. So remember I said the nitrogenous bases bond to one another to form the steps of your ladder. There's an important um, chemical bond that's happening here. And remember that when those two things come together, one has to be a, py a pyrimidine bonded with a purine. And there's a reason for that. Because of their chemical makeup, the orientation allows a hydrogen bond to form. And so a is always going to bond with T. Just going to move this down a bit. So A always comes together with T. Okay. Maybe let's highlight that. So A will always come together with a T. And C complements or comes together with G. That's always how they pair. Okay. And the reason being. So if you look at what's happening, a double ring structure is always going to come together with a single ring structure, double ring with a single ring. Now, in the 
AT combination, you're going to notice just based on their chemical makeup alone that it's a double hydrogen bond in between the A and the T. So these two lines that I'm drawing here represent the fact that it's a double bond between these two nitrogen bases. And you'll notice over here that the orientation of these two molecules, which always come together, have a triple bond. So when C or cytosine comes together with guanine, it's a triple bond. So that's why I've put three lines here. And that's what holds the rungs or steps of the ladder together, are hydrogen bonds. So A and T always form two hydrogen bonds. C and G always form three. Okay, so once we have our, our ladder, it's, it's twisted, and that's where they get the, the term double helix. It's, um, it's twisted in the shape of a helix, and it's got two sides to it, so that's where they come up with the, the um, term double helix. Now, I'm just going to highlight a few of the important things here. So one complete turn okay, of this double helix is 3.4 nanometers. Remember I gave you that small little link to the animation about how big and small things are and they showed you what a nanometer um, was. It's a really, really, really small, small measurement. So you can imagine if one turn is 3.4 nanometers, the distance between each base pair is even less. It's 0 0.34 nanometers. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, there's certain types of bonds and I think I pointed these out, but I just want to refresh your memory. A phosphodiester bond is what forms between the sugars and the phosphates to form the sides of our ladder. So this is a really zoomed in picture of our ladder. And so phosphate and sugar forms our phosphodiester bond. And the second type of bond that forms, and these are just things I want you to highlight and know, glycosal bond. This is the bond that happens between the sugar and your nitrogenous base. Okay, so sugar and nitrogenous base, it's called a glycosal bond. Between the phosphate and the sugar, it's called a phosphodiester bond. Okay, I just want to point out one last thing that I also referred to in my last note as well. Um, something called anti-parallel. So remember I said that the sides of our ladder are anti-parallel to each other? You'll notice in this diagram that one is upright, this side is upright, and these guys are upside down, the, the sides of our ladder. So the phosphates and the sugars are upside down, and the nitrogenous bases. This is what we're referring to as anti-parallel, and I want to point out um, another thing here, how they... Let's see if I can make this smaller. Okay. The ends of each of the sides of your ladder are given names, and I'll, I'll just name them first. So in each end is either called a three prime, this little line means prime end, or the other option is it that can it be, it can be a five prime end. And I'm going to try to explain where they get this um, naming. If we focus on this last sugar here, And we were to look at the carbons. So at each point of these um, of this sugar, they represent a carbon. And so when they number them, they always start here beside the oxygen as number one. So this becomes our second carbon. This is our third carbon, fourth carbon, and then up here is our fifth carbon. And you'll notice this is named the three prime end because the third carbon is where the next phosphodiester bond would form. And that's what gives it its three prime end name. So you can imagine if we're calling it a five prime end and we were to number our sugars in the exact same way. So here's our oxygen in that ring. One starts right here, two, three, 
four, and this is our fifth carbon. The next link in the sides of our ladder is attaching to our fifth carbon, which is why they call it the five prime end. And this is the orientation, this anti-parallel orientation has to happen in order to complement the um, base pairing between these nitrogenous bases. And that's why we end up with this term called anti-parallel, running in the opposite direction. They're parallel to each other, but one's upside down. And that's what anti-parallel means. So this is just sort of an overview, an in-depth sort of look uh, zoomed in on our um, DNA structure. So if you have to play this video back to fill some of these things in or just work through it a little bit slower than I went through, um, all the information's here and what I'd like you to do is print this page out and make it part of your notes. Um, so that in the next stage, what we're going to actually look at is now, how does this DNA molecule make a complete copy of itself? And that's where the term DNA replication comes from.